Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, fantastic day. Um, don't worry about it. Construction activities will probably wrap up in the next few minutes or whatnot. You know, people and tradies like to make sure that they don't get caught up into traffic like, like uh, some of us white collar workers. So, um, uh, but um, we really appreciate everyone being here today, um, uh, continuing part of our uh, circular economy uh, event series. Um, but just to start us off, I'd like to um, acknowledge, uh, uh, make an acknowledgement of country. Um, and uh, I'm ch trying to challenge myself to at least learn a few things in language, in Ghana language. Um, so whilst I will be reading off a script um, uh, and probably butchering a little bit of the language, um, it's just uh, my... Uh, my interactions with um, our, our local Ghana community, um, even trying, uh, trying to say things in the language. Um, uh, I've been uh, notified that that goes a long way in showing respect, um, as well as trying to see how we walk uh, into the future together. So um, uh, the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network, um, Mi Miana Yatia Matanya Wama Tarnatku Tampinthi Yarta Yagalgu Nagalu Tikathi Kuma Tia Kathi Kuma Warpu Yinathi Nadalu Perkana Pukinagu Yala Kuma Taka Ritaya Tapithi Mani Yakanu Tunerti translates to the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network acknowledge the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains. Um, these are the lands we live, learn, and work on. And we pay our respects to elders past, past present, and emerging, and always was and always will be um, Aboriginal land. Um, acknowledging that we are um, uh, uh, on Ghana land and also trying to instill that ethic of custodianship. Um, the ASBN always likes to also acknowledge that. Um, uh, Tandanya, uh, also known as Ad Adelaide, has always been a, a spot for meeting, a, a place for collaboration um, between the Ghana people as well as all of the neighbors surrounding, um, which include the Nagiri, uh, sorry, um, the Naranjiri down south to the uh, Flurio, um, the Pamarank to the Adelaide Hills, um, and the uh, uh, Nadri and Nukanu up toward the York Peninsula. So um, I hope we continue the, uh, as part of um, our event series and uh, connecting in, networking, as well as sharing knowledge. I hope we continue with that ethic. Now, um, as part of our circular economy uh, event stream, um, we're uh, very much honored to have um, Green Industries SA as our, our key um, uh, event uh, stream sponsor. Um, so I'd actually like to in invite Jessica up to say a few words on Green Industries SA and probably some, some interesting things uh, that you might not have known. Jessica. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for that beautiful welcome to country. That was, yeah, really lovely. And I won't, I also can't speak Ghana language, but I really appreciate um, you attempting to do that um, and doing a very good job at it. And yeah, I have to acknowledge the traditional owners and also oh, traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today. Um, so I'm Manager of Policy Reform at Green Industries SA. We're a state government agency um, and we work to drive transition to the circular economy in South Australia. And we're really happy to be supporting um, this event today and, our, and the circular economy stream. The built environment uh, and the construction demolition sector in South Australia has always had a really high recycling rate. And I think it would be fair to say that our focus for quite some time has been on um, recycling um, the construction demolition waste, but we really need to move that to um, reuse, minimising waste and transitioning to a more circular economy and better use of those materials. So to support that, um, we 
uh, recently partnered with Green Building Council Australia, D Squared, Adelaide Sustainable Building Network to explore what those circular economy opportunities are in South Australia and what can be done at different stages, you know, design stage, um, planning stage, construction stage and also reuse and use of those of our built environment. Um, yeah, so the action plan was released um, earlier this year and uh, at a previous event and we're really happy to um, yeah have done that project and look at and start to explore now those next stages of opportunities so um, that's available on our website and also just launched last week um, is our circular procurement knowledge hub so this goal was to document some of those really great things that are happening in South Australia some of those new um, business opportunities uh, reducing reliance on virgin materials keeping materials in circulation for long and improving um, yeah, the management of that, those resources. So please reach out. There's a whole range of different construction um, materials on there that are made of recycled content or different business models that you can explore there. So all of that's available on our website at www.greenindustriessa.gov.au. So thank you. But yeah, very pleased to be supporting this event and thanks for inviting us. <laughs> and and as usual, uh, always appreciate sort of like the leadership um, green industry plays uh, in our uh, local state state government. Um, and and yeah, very very much um, once again honored to be part of the collaborations and also hopefully holding down this space for all of us to to be able to you know again share knowledge. Um, uh, think about ways that we can kind of do things, but um, as as was uh, highlighted in the in the action plan that was kind of put together, it is uh, a lot of this has to come down to um, uh, various people, uh, various people from around the industry, uh, the built environment industry, which is very vast, um, uh, and uh, making sure we can kind of find out where are those linkages within where where how can how can we assist each other within the circular economy. And to be honest with you, I couldn't really think of two better people to kind of step us through through this, especially because one key action point of the action plan was how do we um, strategize and design. It was a, it was almost like in this in this in this whole full circle diagram that they created. There's a key component of that is like how do you strategize and design for the circular economy to set us up for success. Um, so uh, I was extremely uh, uh, pleased um, that Jody and also Nick um, uh, uh, said yes to my crazy idea. I mean, maybe it's not that crazy, but at least um, I, I uh, um, uh, bartered a lunch for a workshop <laughs> um, and asked if they could um, kind of step us through how, how they engage uh, clients, how they engage the industry. Around um, circular economy, uh, knowing that Jody is an incredible strategist as well as a globally renowned circular economy practitioner, and uh, Nick um, here in the Adelaide um, uh, Arab office, also thinking about uh, um, the building systems as well as how they come together and being a real huge champion locally around uh, circularity. So, I actually have no clue what they have planned for us. <laughs> Um, all I know is that I'm I'm the I'm the tech guy. <laughs> so from here, I'm just gonna put. So switch the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm pretty much going to uh, pass over all duties. Um, uh, where they're gonna be the captain they of the ship, now. which is fantastic. Um, I will change the slides, and yep. then uh, Jody and Nick will take it away, and yeah, we'll leave it in their capable hands. Is that okay? Awesome. Are y'all excited? Yeah, no, y'all like need to get revved up because like, yeah, yeah, yeah the that doesn't it, does, it, it doesn't work especially when Jody's at the helm. So, so yeah. I am going to get started and then pass to Nick. But this is such an exciting um, thing for us to be doing today because um, it's really nice when competitors can work together and Arup and Oricon. <laughs> do work together a lot in this space and circular economy is all about collaboration. Um, so we've really like put our teams together and brought what we both do with clients to test out with you today. So it's going to be fun because it's a little bit less smooth than if it had just been Nick or just been me, but you've got like the best of me and the best of Nick and a little bit of, we're not sure what happens next, magic. Enjoy that. 
Um, yeah, so I'm starting out by just giving you a few uh, fundamentals of circular economy and getting you warmed up and meeting each other, which is, of course, the most important reason why we're here today. Um, and I just want to set the framework as well that circular economy is a really interesting space because it's, it's systems work. Um, and each and every one of us are a, a really important part of a system, right? We all hold a piece of the puzzle. So I think there's a lot of other areas where a learning environment like this is, you know, two very clever people imparting all their knowledge on the learners. But actually, you guys are the teachers here today as well. And you're going to be learning lots from each other around your table. And we're going to be learning stuff from you as well. So that's why I love doing these kind of sessions as well, because I'm sorry, but we're here to learn from you as well. So I want you all to know that you're um, an active part of this. And so to start off, this is a post-it note with scribbles on it. Does it look like that? That's about, I, I'm an engineer, that's about as artsy as I get. Um, I would like you guys to spend just five minutes at your table. Um, introduce yourself to each other. Who are you? How much do you know about the circular economy? And write on a post-it note, like, why did you come here? What do you want to get out of here? And I want you to stand up and put those post-it notes over on that glass uh, window. That's the word. <laughs> I'm really good with my built environment stuff. The glass window. Um, and is that's going to help you... Uh, blue tack it if it doesn't stick um, and then we'll know that you're active because you'll have got up and moved around already. So go, have a chat. And it's okay to write came because Ken made me, like that's a really valid... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't be cool, We can. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we need one person from, oh, how one, two, seven... Six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, one of from each of these tables come over to that table at the back. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. I need a volunteer here and one volunteer to the back table. Jess is going. Thank you, Jess. I just want to point out, I love this photo because this is from our team days. We've got an um, Australian team of 15 people that work exclusively on circular economy at Oricon. Um, and we had two days in Adelaide with a um, laughing people. And Chase is over there. She's here today. Um, but guess what this guy does? The, the one person not laughing and being very serious. And He's a finance guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who we invited over, to, and I, I just love it that there's all the like happy uh, circular people in the photo. So don't tell Tom that I said that, he'll get really upset. He actually had a blast, and he's very, very funny. <laughs> so mean. Um, so, I'm just going to tell you a few things about the circular economy, and it's going to be so basic and simple, you're going to go, Ooh, why do we even come? But I'm a big believer that it's really important for us to be able to communicate basics and simple notions to the people that we're working with around us. Um, so consider it part of your toolbox to be able to convey some of these things in really easy ways because you'll be working on sophisticated pieces of the puzzle but if you can you know convey the fundamentals really easily that's great. So basically this is my favorite slide. There's a couple of things to unpack. So first, circular economy is a systems approach. I've mentioned systems already. It's about interconnectedness and about um, whole system change, which makes it a little bit more complex than we'd like. Um, and it's got three main pillars to it. One is to try to remove waste and pollution from the beginning of systems. So rather than trying to reduce it and recycle it at the end, how can we just design it out? Um, second is once things are in our economy, so buildings in our built environment or packaging or whatever, we're trying to retain the value in those things as long as we can. And third, we're trying to regenerate natural systems. So the regenerating natural systems is a great one and one as an engineer I don't do as well as the other two. I'm going to be really open and honest about that and I think there's other people that are the same. 
But if we only do these first two things, um, we're just kind of in a linear economy that's going more slowly. So we're still consuming resources, we're still creating waste, we're doing it a lot slower and we're designing out some of the key ones, but we're still in an extractive economic system. If we don't actually make sure that our ecosystems are safe and healthy and able to um, treat our water or treat our air and all those things that we're getting out of the ecosystem services, then we can't actually function as a planet going forward. So it's really interesting to challenge yourselves to always think about how do we give back to nature? This is all about kind of being less bad, if we're honest. And this is about actually giving back and making sure we've got natural, um, healthy ecosystems. And we're trying to do all this by design. So I like to think of the waste management industry as the absolute heroes of the linear economy. Because if you look in your yellow bin, or what's in your yellow bin, I think that the waste industry is trying to catch all of that crap and plug it back into the economy. They're catching, you know, the stuff that's just being pumped out of the linear economy and trying to put it back in. We want to do all this by design so that it's actually, you know, part of the economy working in that way. So this is like my super basic thing, but you can unpack it in lots of different ways, right? Um, I'm going to break down the retaining part, but just for remove, especially because Jess is here, I think this is a really great example and very simple and one that everyone understands and I go into state and I go yeah in South Australia we do this it's awesome um, so if you think about plastic bags and straws and all that stuff that we just don't want to be managing as a litter problem as a waste problem Jess what have we done in South Australia to design it out of the system that's right <laughs> That's right. So rather than investing in amazing systems to recycle straws, we've gone, well, why do we need them? Like, let's just design them out. Or let's do that by policy ways. And often in the built environment, it can be about how do we design out toxic chemicals that we don't want cycling again and again in our economy. So the second thing I really like to break down, and I found this really useful as a, a kind of mental um, map as well, is what we call the value hill. So it's this idea that as we're digging stuff up out of the ground, we're creating materials, we're putting components together, we're turning it into a beautiful product and we're selling it. At every step of the way, we're adding financial value to that, that widget, right? Um, and we're also adding, we're using, I kind of think about carbon value as we go along as well. So we're actually using more carbon at every step of the way. So the embodied carbon or you know, the carbon backpack of our thing is getting bigger as we go up that value hill. And then we use it for a certain amount of time. So a building a long, long time, single use plastic, five minutes. Um, and if we chuck it away, all that value has been lost. So all that beautiful value that we've built into this product or material thing is just lost down the hill. Um, and so this is where I think Jess mentioned some of those strategies before. We've got lots of strategies to try to keep things at the highest value. So the first, we, we use things for longer, we extend the use, we share the use and we repair things, we refurbish things or resell things. Um, so we've got components that are still working, we remanufacture things and only towards the end we recycle and recover the materials because by then we've really lost most of the value in what we're looking at. So this is a really useful framework that I find, I'm not even using my corny mobile phone joke today. Um, so I just, I love presenting this because it's like it's so dumb and so simple but you know basically if you're using those frameworks you can get through any discussion around circular economy and think through implications right so I wanted to try to do that as a group sharing this picture does anyone recognize or want to guess at what this building is I think you should know it you do right we we should ask the the people I've got to check does anyone know what this building may or may not be no, it's not in South Australia. You know it, right? It is an Oricon office where? Brisbane. Did Lendley's building? 
Yeah, it was low moon, wasn't it? Great. Was it? Shit, maybe it was Mervac. <laughs> <laughs> cut it out. Cut out the video. Cut it. Cut the video. <laughs> Sorry, I want you to have to edit this thing. We can't show it to Tom. We can't show it to the um, So, yeah, this is our um, office at 25 King Street, Brisbane. And when Oricon contacted me to say, we'd love you to lead circular economy, this was one of the reasons why I came to Oricon, because I knew about this office. I knew how amazing it was. I loved it. Um, so it is a modular prefabricated timber building um, and I love this photo that I only discovered last week of it actually being built because I've been able to get into our image library. So I would like someone to give some examples of why might this kind of system be circular or why not. I put that it depends because um, if anyone anyone's done like life cycle analysis and things like that, the answer to most things can be well, it depends. Is it circular? Well, it depends on it. And I think those it depends questions are really interesting to tease out as well. And I want you to give your answers uh, thinking about the three pillars as well. So does someone, can someone give me an example of why this might be or might not be circular and depending on what? You breathed. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> What's your name? Paolo. Paolo. Yeah. Um, I think just, I'm sorry. I mean, it being modular, like, my first thought was perhaps with an, an office fit out, you know, they change it a few years and, and, and things need to be reconfigured. Maybe it's got the option to be reconfigured down the line and you don't have to waste some time. That's a good example. Yeah. So reconfiguring office spaces, so designing for them to be able to chop and change yeah. easily in the future. That's awesome. Someone else? It's not a homogeneous structure because everything is like a separate unit. Uh, as, as a conventional construction, we use sealants and all those things, which are like when we combine all those things, they become a homogeneous. Okay, so do you think this is less used homogeneous is the word? Yes, yeah, so every part is, a, is an individual thing, so that's why we can be as we just we are just removing that homogeneity with the construction. Okay, so it's less locked together. Is that what we mean? And how would that be more circular or less circular? It is, it is combined, but every individual part is unique in itself. Okay, great. Anyone else? Did you replace a tree? Oh, that's interesting. Forestry stewardship. Forestry stewardship. Why forestry stewardship? So it's coming from renewable. Yeah, coming from renewable supply chain. Yeah. So that's and it depends, so right? Actually the, the, the industry to yeah. more trees as opposed to just chopping down. That's right. And that's a really important it depends when we're looking at wood because it can be amazing, it can be terrible if it's from bad forestry, but usually if you've got forest stewardship, it can be amazing. So that's a really great and important, it depends when you see someone go, yay, renewable materials, well, where did it come from, is that managed correctly, all those questions. Also depends on the vehicle that's going forward, the module, um, who the site, but also the transport the material to make the module to the factory where it will change. So you want the logistics chain to actually be more efficient as well and think through that wider system, not just what's happening on site, but what's happening where else. Anyone else? You could say from a, uh, a life cycle point of view, the body carbon and water use is less. Why? Concrete. Yep, concrete versus renewable yep. timber, yep. Can it, can it actually genuinely be reused? That's a really great and important, it depends. Can it be reused in Australia? Would it be able to be reused if it was in Europe as well? We've got different infrastructure recycling schemes. Is it designed to be disassembled? Are there chemical components? So that's a really, really big, it depends, to unpack when you're seeing a building like that. And sometimes as well, we're designing for disassembly and for recycling, but maybe the recycling infrastructure hasn't caught up yet but we're designing it so that hopefully in 40, 60, 80 years, it should be able to be more easily reused and recycled. There's, we're not in a perfect system yet as well, right? Anyone else? Yep. That's a really, really good one. Really, really good one. Is it greenfield? Is it not greenfield? Has something come down or not? Yep, could have we have not built? Yep. First question, do we need this? Really, really big one. 
being um, designed to be retained as well. Designed to be retained. Unpack what you mean by designed to be retained. Just using uh, like modular construction by the Coastal Timber Coastal Stewardship Timber as well. Yep. It has a much more attractive um, economy of retaining the actual timbers itself. Because people would be more attracted to use it and move into it. Because uh, it's an awesome building and gorgeous yeah. Yeah. and great for people. Yeah, that's a really good one. That's a really good one. That, that value element as well, the sort of sentimental and emotional value of things. And that's a really important one for designers as well, right? How can they make this building gorgeous and people want to be in there and people want to adapt it for the future? It's not always about that it's come to its end of life technically. Sometimes it's just come to its end of life because people think it's meh. That's the technical term. Meh. Meh. It's French. Um, and I wanted to draw your attention to um, this. I love this document. It's perfectly imperfect, but it's such a great stepping point for Australia in terms of circular design principles. So the New South Wales government released, yeah, beginning of this year, I was thinking last year already, um, guidelines for circular economy, circular design for the built environment. Um, and we've actually been doing a piece of work where we look at the relative um, carbon benefits of these different um, strategies as well. And it's just a really great um, example of the different kind of strategies. So the strategies at material selection stage, at design kind of stage, um, design for longevity, hang on. And yeah, this one that is by far the most important is that reuse of existing assets and materials. And we've seen that a lot. Um, so I, and I think this is a really good sign that Australia is becoming a lot more sophisticated around circular building design as well, and that that's going to sort of make waves a little bit. So with that, oh, yep. Not yet. They're developing it. So it's, it's quite a high level document if you've looked at it. There's not a lot of detail in it. There's been a lot of thought put into the structure and what they're, they're signposting, but they're working behind the scenes on all the metrics and what does it mean for policy and how do they track it. So that's what I wanted to share to get started. Yep. Now handing over to Nick to that's... DJ set. <laughs> and then we're going to make you work your butts off. Yeah, it's a bit of a joke. Um, that's actually a very good segue by Jody because this this is sort of I did it uh, intentionally. Yeah, this area of reuse of materials is kind of the um, uh, what sparked my interest in the circular economy, I suppose. So I'm I'm not uh, I wouldn't claim to be a circular economy expert. I'm sort of in the enthusiast advocate kind of uh, champion practitioner champion uh, basket, if you like. Um, and uh, but yeah, just really. Uh, enthusiastic about doing what we can to um, implement it. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. We make all of them videos as well. Okay. Yeah. And the previous slide is a document you can download that actually goes into each of the strategies, um, sort of a page per strategy that outlines it and stuff. It's really great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't want to consume too much time, but what, what we were going to show you, so our, our, um, in um, uh, partnership with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, which does everyone know about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation? Anyone not know about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation? Hands up. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so Ellen MacArthur uh, sol uh, circumnavigated uh, the world uh, as a sailor um, and uh, is a sort of environmental advocate, um, but was, was really interested um, in in uh, this idea that the you know the linear economy was just a dead end, we've just got to change it. So uh, yeah, sh super passionate about the circular economy, um, and uh, there is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is focused on all things circular, not just obviously the built environment, but everything. Um, uh, so our has done a bit of work with them in creating uh, a toolkit, which uh, is what we're going to sort of use as the as the loose basis for today's uh, interactive exercise um so instead of me talking to you about it i've got a video which <laughs> which is which is way better um and it's got nice music too so this is what i'm going to show you uh if i can uh, is the speaker audio up can you yep. test that right. oh awesome there you go the world has woken up to the climate crisis the effects of which are already being felt one of the largest contributors is the built environment to realise a net zero, 
likely to cause the future. The building industry needs to reduce the impact its demand for products and materials is having on the planet. The circular economy is critical to achieving net zero, as well as reducing the use of virgin materials, capturing long-term value, increasing resilience, reducing waste, and creating new economic opportunities. So, how can we realise the benefits that the circular economy has to offer? A framework built around four principles is designed to help the building industry tackle global challenges at every stage of a project's lifespan. Build only what you need. Do we need a brand new building? Instead, we can reuse, adapt, or transform existing buildings to meet future needs. Key Porter Tower in Sydney was built around an existing hall, retaining 68% of the original structure, reducing the requirement for new materials that saved 12,000 tons of carbon and 130 million dollars. Build with the right materials. When we do build, we should use renewable, bio-based materials, or those with a lower embodied carbon. We should track and set targets around material use, collecting data through material passports, which allow them to be recovered and reused in the future. Build efficiently. There are opportunities to save carbon and cut waste with every decision, no matter how small. Designers for One Triton Square in London adopted a marginal gains approach, analyzing every system and component to maximize performance, resulting in a saving of 40,000 tons of carbon and 43% reduction in costs. Builds for long term value. Buildings don't last forever but their parts can be reused. Bramley Town Hall in the Netherlands was designed to be dismantled after 20 years, selecting prefabricated timber components and avoiding difficult to recycle materials allowed for 90% of the original building to be reused, turning it into a material bank for the construction of future buildings. The building industry needs to adopt a circular mindset across the entire project lifespan. Through strong leadership, collaboration, innovative circular business models, and digital technology, we can transform the industry and achieve a net zero and nature positive future. Search for the circular buildings tool. Um, yeah, so that's the fancy video, but um, it, it gives a really good overview of the, the four kind of principles that are embedded within the circular building toolkit, uh, which you can use and you should use. I mean, it's there are many different uh, strategies and, and tools that are available, um, but this is a, a good, simple one uh, that, that's free to use. And that's what we're going to use as the basis for our, our stuff today. Um, we don't have heaps of time, so I'm not going to talk too much, but what I'm going to just very quickly touch on is um, an example, a local example. So what, what we're going to do today, um, instead of everybody being on their computers, uh, what we've decided to do is to uh, print out um, uh, a whole series of the, the, I think there's 47 different actions that you can consider before you start your your building project and see if if they're going to um, be able to be integrated or used. Um, and so we're going to we're going to use that as the basis for the for the workshop. But I just wanted to go through uh, because it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. A very simple example, okay, to give you a bit of a flavour of what we what we're going to try and do. On the website, um, there are a number of these uh, case studies which you can go through in a lot of detail in in your own time, which can provide kind of moments of inspiration. Um, not any one of these projects does everything or seeks to do everything. It, um, each project's obviously got its own nuances and its own challenges and its own opportunities to do something cool. Um, uh, I think you might have even shown, uh, you might have showed this before, uh, Ken. I think I saw a presentation of yours, or maybe it was someone else, I don't know. But this is, this is just one particular example where um, uh, a simple idea of, of using uh, something that's uh, potentially destined for landfill. Um, how can we grab that resource and, and, and integrate it into a, into a new building? Um, uh, uh, X-Brain, which is, a, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna 
watch that video, but the X frame system uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a system approach to be able to do that. Now, um, this is an, a very small project, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, which, which floated across my, de my desk. Um, I think the, the whole circular economy is only going to be successful with the, with the system approach. So we're all part of that system. And the great thing that I saw on some of those post-it notes today was that one of the reasons that people have come here is to network. So the more that we kind of uh, grow our knowledge collectively in this space and also challenge each other to do better and more, um, the more that we're going to be able to demand of the industry uh, circular, you know, innovative circular approaches. Um, but each one of us, uh, in our own little way, in, in whatever we're doing, can, can influence the project outcome. So this particular project, we didn't do, uh, we didn't go through the circular economy uh, toolkit formally. We didn't do, uh, we didn't sit down and do a workshop. Um, but informally, um, what we did was think about things that we could apply on this project at the very start of the project. So um, when it was floated across my desk, the, 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 it's, a, it's an existing building in, in Adelaide. So um, what it, it's the Telstra building. The, the owner wanted to uh, reposition the asset. So they actually did look at potentially, you know, um, are we going to completely remove the entire facade? Um, and thankfully, the, the design team was able to um, uh, refuse that. So this is, this is one of the first um, actions that which Jody talked about as well is, is the, do we even really need this? Um, do we need to, do we need to uh, uh, put a new facade on the building? And so what we managed to do was to convince them uh, we don't need to replace the entire facade. And even the, the ground floor facade that the architects have designed this kind of new flash facade, what, like why are we removing the existing glass that's there? I don't understand, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, and so that, that uh, is, is an example here. Uh, uh, number eight. So um, this is, oops. Um, uh, reusing the use of virgin and non-renewable uh, materials. And this is sort of like a, an area which I'm uh, super passionate about pers personally, which is reclaiming uh, what's already there. And so in this particular project, we've used this idea of um, grabbing all of the existing glass, going back to all of the old data that we've got on that glass, working out where we can move a couple of panels, uh, and then everything else that can't be reused on the project. Um, unfortunately, there's not a system in place in the market for us to uh, get these materials and components and get them to be reused. So we're gonna do it manually. So um, you'll see a strange, peculiar LinkedIn post from me um, to all of my architect friends <laughs> um, to base, with, a, with a full documentation of every single component uh, that is gonna be available on this building within about uh, six months time. Uh, and the owner, Quintessential, has offered to give it all away for free, but also store it, uh, which is one of the, the challenges in the circular economy is storing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small gesture, but it's just one thing that as a design professional, um, we've been able to uh, contribute to. But the more and more people that do this sort of thing or that take these actions, uh, the more the market will respond. Um, so that's the end of what I wanted to say formally. Oh, yeah. Uh, the hardest part was that the architect, um, like when the, the client and the architect were, were partying like it was 1999. I mean, all they understood was cost. Um, the only reason we actually took on the commission really was because um, I wanted to do less. Uh, on, I wanted to convince them to not replace the entire facade or to replace even um, the, the ground floor entry facade. Um, and so the first challenge was actually just getting the client to understand that <clears throat> if we keep this, it's cheaper. So they understood that, and that was easy. Um, the hardest part was telling the architect might not look quite as good. It might not be as perfect as you want it to be in as you've rendered it. You know, and so you're going to have to change your mindset. Uh, we're not. Uh, it's not about like building perfection anymore. It's about. Um, uh, uh, you know, reuse and sustainability. That's that's where it's at. So, um, I think the hardest part is yeah, just changing the mindset of some of the people in the industry. The easiest part was the money discussion. Like, like the honestly, as soon as I said to Quintessential, um, you know, that 
your architect wants to completely replace all of this glass, uh, there's no point. We, we can actually reconfigure the facade. We can do what you're trying to do um, in the repositioning and aesthetic upgrade of the asset to attract the new tenants, um, but at, at a fraction of the material cost. And, and by the way, that's also a fraction of the dollar cost as well. And so that, that was easy. So, yeah. So sustainability doesn't always cost more. Um, so sh should, we, should we get on to the exercise? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so we've got some sheets to put on each table. We're gonna, we wanna work through some practical case studies, but we haven't imposed them on you. So we've got, we've just printed out a couple of examples of projects. Does anyone have, because so we wanna take a real project or it can be an imaginary project, but we need a context, right? Whether it's a, a bike station or a house or whatever it might be. So did anyone come here today with a project in mind going, I would love to get the Brains Trust working on this development that I'm working on or this project of mine? Someone say yes, please. We can do Kerry's house. Anyone? You're breathing. <laughs> um, a free park coming school. So, school. Yeah, right. yeah, but that's that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Put, well, you, that could be your tables. Well, we yeah. actually had. You had, and you had I was, a school example. Yeah, I was going to push Emily, just make her feel really awkward and say, Emily, can you read out like the three examples that we've got? We've only got three though, so we need one more that's awesome. Yeah. Beautiful. We're missing a housing one. I want that one. We, yeah, we want yeah, that it's one, right? Yeah, very topical. Um, yeah. The South Australian Housing Trust, uh, no one's here from there. Do we need to record this session? How important it is to record this session? I think that, and, and, um, uh, it's, it's not a criticism. I think that, um, uh, yeah, we, we need to be very careful about uh, setting some of the strategies right for some of that affordable housing now yeah. and not just going, uh, we need to please the minister and get them built as quick as possible and this is how much money we've got. We need to yeah. take a step back and go, well, hang on a minute, we're going to build this. Uh, it's got to be like proper for the long term. Um, so that's a great example. Yeah. So you're going to crack yeah. that today, okay? Yeah. 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 And it, you could you can choose uh, multi-story, which I know Saha's looking at, as well as single story. Um, or, you know, like yeah. a, a, or duplex dwelling. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've got okay. one on affordable housing. So what what school did you give? I liked it because it just gives a bit of context. So what we've done is just taken a couple of project examples of things that are already built, but we can kind of use it to reverse engineer and just give a give it a bit of guts and a bit of constraint. Here's the type of thing we could work on. So that that's a school for you to judge up. Yeah. What else we got? A lab. That's oh, awesome. that's good. Yeah. Let's no, do a that's lab. fantastic. Yeah. Are you happy to share information? Like, not, nothing confidential, but just a lab. It's big. It needs this. It... Perfect. Okay, that's good. Sweet. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good one. Yeah. Did you guys have anything that is a burning desire? Yeah, it's a well in progress is the infrastructure yeah. toolkit. Yeah, but so let's focus on what are the, the two options you've got. Is one of them work? Flinders Medical Center is good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is an old one that's ready to be done, but Eric and I are kind of working no, on that together. I, the reason why I'm, I'm, I, I actually want to run a, it's almost too late uh, in some ways, but I want to run a circular economy workshop on that project. So we. Yeah. Well, you should, you're, you're, we're both working on it. Yeah. So yeah. We should get there. Yeah. All right. Um, so you can be the Flinders table. All right. Are you? Have we got the sheets out yet? Do you remember what we're doing for the first sheet, Nick? 
Um, I don't exactly remember, so you have to. There's instructions on the sheet. So we're going to be roaming and there's, um, sorry, we haven't introduced our teams either. So um, can the Oricon and Arup team stand up and wave your hand and introduce yourselves to the room? So we've got Chase, Luke, is that where's is that and Emily? Uh, and can I just mention, uh, Jess talked about the amazing circular economy procurement videos now online. Emily makes an amazing cameo as a uh, presenter interviewer in those videos as well, which we were so comfortable about doing. Um, so watch that for Em as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we'll be wandering around, getting going on these first sheets, and there's another exercise to do after that. Um, so. Should we let them yep. add it? Yep, I think, uh, I wonder if I can put... 20 or 30 minutes? Or how many? How 20 much, minutes? How 20, 20 minutes for the first one, Em? Yep. Yep. Well, yeah. The first Great. And can I just point out for everyone that's going, oh my goodness, they printed out so much paper. Who are these circular economy hypocrites? <laughs> um, there's a lot of really interesting LCA studies on the relative environmental footprint of paper versus screens. So if we can now turn the screens off for the rest of the day, that actually will compensate for the paper, which we will reuse. Thank you. So don't forget that screens and electronics have footprints too. It's nothing's for free. <laughs> and we want to hear lots of talking and chatting and writing down and having fun. <laughs>